So first of all, welcome, uh, welcome to the, uh, to the to the studio, and welcome to the program. It's good to see you. You're looking very well. Thank you, John. Nice, to, nice to be here, and thank you for inviting me. And what a lovely studio you've got, and what a great view. Well, sadly, behind me, so only you could see it. Well, starting off in the, in such a cordial way, and, and, and I ask, not not purely through through politeness, but I wonder. It must be a difficult time for you. you you've been at Westminster as an MP for nearly 40 years, five of those years as leader of the party, and then, what, 18 months or so ago, you are literally an outcast. Now, that must be hard. I'm not an outcast at all. I'm happy with the people. I've just been come from a demonstration outside Westminster Magistrates Court in support of Julian Assange, and um, I'm incredibly busy on lots of things all the time. Mm. Um campaigning, conferences, speaking engagements, travel, and obviously a great deal of work representing my constituency. So, um, yes, what's happened since um, the general election is uh, beyond unfortunate, but that doesn't mean that I'm silent. I'm extremely active in Parliament as well, speaking debates. And yeah, I'd have, been, I'd have been amazed if you'd given me any other answer uh, than that. So let's, let's just cover a few a few things. I want to start with the, probably the biggest story in the world today, which is the Ukraine, yeah. Ukraine war. Now, you have criticised the invasion of Ukraine by Vladimir Putin's yes. Russia. In case there's any doubt about that, you have. And there's you have, no doubt whatsoever. And you have done, totally you have done clearly it. on platforms and in other, in other places. So do you then agree, Jeremy, with, with so much of world opinion, with, with Joe Biden of America, with Volodymyr Zelensky, that, Vlad, that Vladimir Putin is a war criminal and ought to face justice in an international court. The evidence appears to be that there are war crimes, and I'm using the words cautiously because I think that to um, shout war crime, yes, to look at the evidence is very important, and the International Criminal Court must look at that evidence. I have totally condemned the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, but I also think there has to be real pressure for a ceasefire and interested that Antonio Guterres has called for a number of a number of times has called for a ceasefire but has now called for one during Orthodox Easter which actually is quite a powerful message because both Ukraine and Russia are followers of the Orthodox Church albeit mm -hmm. there are schisms between the two um, two bishops at the moment but nevertheless they're both in the Orthodox tradition yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to come. To be a I'm going to come to that okay. question in, in just a second, just as you'd expect. But I asked you about about Vladimir Putin, and you you did not join those saying that he's a war criminal. Now I, I suggest to you, we all know, don't we? The world knows that if Vladimir Putin decreed that these atrocities should not happen, the the mass graves, the mass killing, the the, the systematic rape, infanticide, if he were to give the order. He's the unchallenged supreme commander of those Russian forces. They would not be happening. He is responsible. He is therefore, you yeah, could fairly the, argue, a war criminal. He and is the commander in chief himself. of the of the Russian forces, and therefore, as with the U.S. president being the commander in chief of the U.S. forces, they must take ultimate responsibility for the behaviour of their armed forces, and that is clear. And so, the evidence must be collected and sent to the International Criminal Court, they must undertake the investigation. Now, the war itself, then, you're not a pacifist. I mean, some people might imagine you're a pacifist, but you you defended the Spanish Civil War, to take one example, against uh, Franco's uh, uh, fascist forces in, in, in Spain. Is the Ukraine war a just war? Well, it's not a just war, because Russia had no business invading Ukraine. On the side so, of Ukraine, is it a well, just war? Well, Ukraine has to defend itself, but I would go back uh, a stage, um, somewhere along the line, some terrible mistakes have been made. Um, that has um, emboldened Russia to the extent that it believes it could invade Ukraine. And uh, the war is abominable in every sense, and I think the world needs to be now calling for a ceasefire. Mm. And... Um, Obviously, we watch the twos and fro's of the war day in, day out. The Western media are 
on it all the time. Russian peace activists are also on it, but suffering a great deal as a result and don't get much um, oxygen of publicity, unfortunately. Uh, I wish they did, because I do think there is significant opposition in Russia to the war, mm. not just um, from those very brave people that have taken to the streets and opposed the war, but also from... Uh, probably some people in the military mm. as well who see this as a disaster for and Russia. I do, and I want to come further to that too in a, in a moment. Or two. Just what may be the, what may turn out to be the way out of this appalling, appalling conflict. But you are accepting that on the Ukraine side, they are fighting a rightful cause. They are fighting a just war. You do accept that. Well, they're being invaded, therefore they have to... Right. So that undo. being so, you do accept so, that. Um, but I want to pursue the path and the language of peace and that has to be uppermost in our minds at the present time because otherwise the war will get worse it will go on longer there will be further invasion there will be um, presumably then occupation and uh, I really struggle to understand mm. how Russia if it ever had the intention of occupying the whole of Ukraine how on earth it was ever going to control it because uh, the history of Ukraine going back a long time, Second World War and before that, is not a happy one yeah. over occupation by a, anybody. There's a widespread view that the Russian invasion, as, as it was carried out, certainly so far, has been in, in so many ways a mistake. But if, if you do then, as you do say, the invasion was entirely unjustified, as you also now say, Ukraine have a right to defend themselves in the way they are trying to do, it follows, doesn't it? That, that the United Kingdom, that NATO countries, that Western countries were and are right to train and to arm the Ukraine military in this war. The problem is that the more arms are poured in and the energy is put into supporting militarily the Ukraine, then we'll end up with a very long and proxy war. But it's surely, Jeremy, no, just well, right there, just right there on that... <laughs> Without the, the munitions and the equipment that the Ukrainians say they need so desperately badly, especially now we're in a new bloody phase of this awful, awful war, they would be left helpless against the Russian war machine. They, they be, need those weapons. It's right, is it not, to be, supply them? They would be in a worse position had they not got those. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty clear about that. But I just reiterate the point that the longer the war goes on, mm. The more people are going to be killed, the more bitterness is going to be at the end of it, yeah. the more tragedies, the more refugees. And uh, the danger is that this whole thing then becomes, think through Korea, think through Vietnam, mm. think through so many other conflicts that have become proxy wars between the United States and in the past the Soviet Union, now Russia. Yes. I don't want that, you don't want that, nobody wants that. Mm. Therefore, I ask myself the question, why the UN has been so supine and inactive mm. in this. All they've done is issued some condemnations. Why wasn't Antonio Guterres on mm. his way to Moscow at the very beginning of this? Why not? I well, asked that the question. The UN is a legitimate question. Um, look, it has something to do with the fact that Russia has a seat on the Security Council and China does too. But leaving that just for the moment, if so I can focus... Britain and France. And so does Britain and, and France. If I can focus on this for a, a moment, if it is so that Ukraine would be in maybe a helpless position without the munitions they're being given, are you accepting, Jeremy, just clearly for the record, are you accepting that the West is right to supply those weapons and to go on supplying those weapons? I think they should be defensive and I think they should be humanitarian and uh, I make the point that um, but is it, is it isn't, a, is an anti -ship it, missile it isn't a defensive, is, a, isn't, is an anti-tank missile defensive? Probably. It isn't a solution to the conflict to keep on supplying arms any more than a solution to the conflict for Russia to carry on invading. There has to be some process that really is serious about this. Mm. You, I mean, you and I are old enough to remember the um, process of the Vietnam War and all the opportunities that were lost to bring about ceasefires and, um, and some sort of um, maybe uneasy peace, but at least a peace. Anything that stops the killing now mm. has got to be worth a try. But in a word then, if you were the Prime Minister today and you, you hoped to be that at a certain stage, the Labour Party was working to make you uh, this country's Prime Minister, you would be aiding Ukraine, not just with humanitarian uh, supplies, but also with the weapons, the missiles, the anti-tank equipment that they're being given now. You but would be approving that, is, Jeremy. I would have been much more involved much earlier 
in trying to... Why would you be doing that? Just give uh, me that. Anyway, I would have been involved much earlier to try to bring about some resolution to what is obviously a conflict. There's obviously a conflict about the Donbass. There's obviously a conflict about um, Crimea. There is also this um, synergy of uh, Russian-speaking people in Ukraine, Ukrainian-speaking people in Russia and all those kind of things it is a tragedy mm. beyond belief. Now, I understand you've just been there and you'd confirm the tragedy that it is that's going on and it's almost medieval, the Battle of Mariupol that's going on, which is yeah. sort of it. The pictures I'm seeing remind me of pictures of Stalingrad. Yeah, I mean, utter waste, devastation, the mass loss of human, yeah. human life. And, and just so the point is not lost... Were you to be Prime Minister today, I'm just, just looking for a very clear one-word answer, you would be supplying all the weapons that this country and others are supplying now? I would now. be supporting uh, Ukraine's right to defend itself, but I would be also making the point, which I've made in this interview, that we have to also be, which I don't detect from anything Boris Johnson or Biden have said, actually demanding some kind of dialogue and peace that has to be. I don't. I absolutely condemn um, but no Putin that, and what Jeremy. Russia No, one, no one's done. disagreeing. There needs no, to be No, but they're not doing it. The, well, it's not happening at the moment, and maybe that has something to do with Vladimir Putin, well, simply not being interested it, in any kind of it, a, a move, let alone the brutality of his conflict. Does, but it does but, look where we are now. Yeah. The question has to be answered, would you give Zelensky the weapons he needs? And you say, yes, you would. But we would also be pursuing a a peace, and there has to be a longer-term security. A ceasefire on its own is not peace any more than a ceasefire in Yemen at the moment is peace. And uh, if I may say so, I think um, our media have quite rightly concentrated and reported very heavily on Ukraine, and I absolutely support that. They have not concentrated as heavily on the disasters in Yemen or Afghanistan at the present time either. Now, maybe it's hard for the media to concentrate on more than one big story at a time, but I I just think we have to recognise the totality of war and the treatment of victims of Mm. war should be equal wherever they are. Yeah, look, I mean, uh, we we could debate that at length just on its own, Mm. but uh, uh, the situation at the moment... Putin and Moscow are describing this war in Ukraine as a conflict to denazify Ukraine. They suggest that Ukraine is a Nazi regime. That is a lie, isn't it? That is a smear used as propaganda. It is a strange use of language. No, no, this no, is can a I lie. Finish, can I finish? Um, this, it's a strange use of language. Yes, there are some far right forces in the Donbass. But to call the government of Ukraine and society a, a Nazified society is simply absurd. Absurd. And, uh, and, and Vladimir Zelensky, who was seen by so much of the, of the world and now as a, a hero. He is a hero of a kind that we haven't seen, I think, for many, many years. Do you accept that description of Vladimir Zelensky? Well, he must be quite surprised he's in this situation. He became president, um, I assumed as far as I could follow it in that he would be able to have some kind of agreement and accommodation with Russia and indeed had accommodated to some extent the um, Luhansk and Donetsk um, situation. Yeah, you know, the, the Minsk Accords which Russia, yeah, Russia and, uh, broke. But, but do you, do you view, consider Vladimir Zelensky, Jeremy, that... do you consider Zelensky a hero yourself? He stood up in a very difficult situation and he's <clears throat> managed to unite people and get a very important world stage to expose what's going on. But the next stage has to be to stop the fighting. We can't just be spectators in the horror what's going on in front of us when mm-hmm. if we're in a position to do anything about it, we should do something about it. Do you it. admire him as a leader? I've never met him, I don't know. Well, I can't I've really never met that. him and I <coughs> certainly admire oh, I him. Do you admire him? I think he speaks well, and I admire that. Okay. <laughs> well, a certain qualification. Maybe you're not in the business of attributing the, the hero hero medal. Look, now, as you made clear a number of times, you want this war to end at a negotiating table. How How is that possible? Vladimir Putin clearly is only concerned with the subjugation and domination of Ukraine. He's left Ukraine with no option but to carry on fighting. He has... Uh ordered his forces to invade. Um, They appear to have changed tactics after they got a much bigger pushback than they expected from the Ukrainian forces. And it now looks as though the strategy is the occupation of the Donbass and the eastern part of the country. Um, 
what happens after that, who knows? Uh, I would hope we can get some kind of ceasefire quickly, which would then mean there would have to be some kind of complicated, possibly UN-led, possibly other guarantors, um, long-term ceasefire Russia and agreement. Interested in a ceasefire. At the moment, Russia is not. But then um, Russia was not interested in many other things, but became so afterwards. Because when the body bags go back to Russia, and those they young... By the thousand, Jeremy. Well, the young conscripted soldiers that are dying in Ukraine, when they go back, the anger in those communities is going to be huge, just as the anger was in communities very huge. Mm. Although about, Russians are being given such a about, distorted picture, they have no idea of what is going on in Ukraine. Well, there is some some source of information, but clearly um, Russian media will, will give the Russian point of view. Mm. Well, I mean, organisations, I, I should say, like Russia Today, put a purely, purely Russian point of view. You, you appeared frequently on Russia Today, Jeremy. I wonder, in passing, do you regret that now? No, because what I said on Russia Today, actually many years ago, uh, what I said on Russia Today was largely about the war in Afghanistan. And I made the point in, in and Iraq and other international issues, including Palestine and so mm. on. I made the point then that Russia was um, suffered greatly from Afghanistan, the Afghanistan war mm. and others. Um, d- you were supporting a, the, a state broadcaster of an adversary state. Well, um, you could argue the same for almost any broadcasting outlet that um, tends to mirror what its own government says. And so uh, there are plenty of American outlets like um, Fox News and others that uh, basically parroted what Trump was saying. Would would I be wrong to appear on Fox News? I don't know. I I want to move on from this in a minute. So I think that um, Russia today, anyway, it's not broadcasting in Britain, so it's it's not an issue any longer. But um, I think uh, having news outlets and a diversity of them is actually quite important. And uh, I've been following various websites and news sources. I'm sure you do as a professional journalist. And... uh, Yes, I follow the BBC, I also follow Al Jazeera, and you look at CNN, you look at Agence France Press and so on. Before we we move on, you have always, you've consistently criticised NATO as an aggressive expansionist project. Now, Labour never bought into that position, and you accepted that, let alone the British people, they never have either. Now, in the light of this invasion, this brutal, bloody, appalling invasion, Jeremy, have you changed your mind at all? that your own personal view, that NATO should be disbanded or the UK should leave NATO? Look, I don't believe that um, NATO caused the invasion of Ukraine. I believe that Russia caused the invasion of Ukraine by a decision made by Vladimir Putin. Um, What I do think it's important to analyse historically is what happened after the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1990-91, when uh, the Soviet Union essentially collapsed in part because of the Afghanistan war, but also economic and nationalist issues. Um, And the Warsaw Pact broke up. The raison d'etre for NATO disappeared at that time. There was then a quite serious debate about the direction in which um, military alliances should go at that stage. And there was um, people on both the left and the right all took a view including, I believe, even Kissinger, I'm not sure, but I think he took some kind of view on that, that maybe NATO expansion into a global role was not a good thing. Perhaps we should be looking at European security and cooperation as being the basis for the future. And for an early part of the 1990s, that indeed was the case. And then more hawkish elements took over, and NATO went then into expansion, and that in turn expansion was mirrored by greater militarism in Russia. Has Vladimir Putin and the people around him changed? I don't know. They probably have. They've probably become more hawkish. He certainly has become much more hawkish. Could things have been changed historically? It's a bit like watching um, a rerun of the build-up towards World War One, 
when a series of military alliances grew and those military alliances ended up with that massive conflict which killed millions and millions of people. So we always have to look historically as well as at the presence of what's going on. All right, so, so you do believe still, you still believe that NATO bears responsibility for militarism in, in Russia. Not total responsibility, <clears throat> but it bears responsibility um, for that. And here's my question to you. Though. Well, it's a bit simplistic to put it that way. What I would say is that the historical process um, after 1990 and 1901, the breakup of the Soviet Union, was an opportunity. It was an opportunity that was partly taken in some countries where defence expenditure started to go down, the um, agreements that were made between Russia and the United States, the ABM Treaty, support for non-proliferation treaty, and a number of other disarmament agreements were actually made mm. during that period. That is surely what we have to return well, to. We cannot question. go in for yeah. a sort of perpetual war with Russia. But my basic question is this, and I think it's a valid one, that you believe that after the fall of the, the Soviet bloc, that was a moment to disband NATO. We are where we are now. We have the experience of the, the Ukraine last election, war. Uh, not saying we would leave yeah, NATO, leave but saying that, not. It, yeah, that we would um, try to influence it. Indeed. Um, indeed. But I'm, I'm talking about your view its now, future yeah. direction. And as I say, Labour never entirely bought into your interpretation of, of this question, but I'm putting the question to you now. If the time was ripe to disband NATO at the fall of the Soviet bloc in the light of the Ukraine invasion, do you now, today, as you sit there, still believe it would be right to disband NATO or for Britain to leave? I would want to see a world where we start to ultimately disband all military alliances. No, now wait a minute. And today, you, here. Yeah, I know, you, I know what you're trying to do. I fully understand that. The issue has to be, what's the best way of bringing about peace in the future? Is it by more alliances? Is it by more military build-up? Or is it by... Um, stopping the war in Ukraine and the other wars which you haven't mentioned at all in this discussion that are going on at the present time, uh, which are also killing a very large number of people. And ask yourself the question, do military alliances bring peace or do they actually encourage each other and build up to a greater danger? Yeah. I don't blame NATO for the fact that Russia's in invaded Ukraine. What I say is look at the thing historically and look at the process that could happen at the end of the Ukraine war. Yeah. And your conclusion at the end of that argument, I'm going to move on, but your, your conclusion at the end of the argument you've just given is that it would be right to disband NATO now. Look, um, it's not going to be disbanded now. What it, I think will happen is some kind of much deeper security discussion, as indeed NATO was having a security discussion with Russia until mm. last year. They were even having joint exercises only three Your years ago. This hasn't changed. My view is that uh, military alliances tend to yeah. build up um, a mirror image of each other, and you, get the, and you get the danger okay. because of that. And we'd be better off with that, Nancy. Well, I think we'd be better off in a world at peace rather than a world at war. And we'd be better off with all those resources, instead of going into military equipment and military development and military expenditure, we're actually dealing with the world food crisis and the environmental crisis and the health crisis that we face at the present time. Money spent on weapons is money not spent on health, education and housing right there's and there's there's your argument now look let's look at matters closer to home uh, concerning you and the the labor party and in islington north where you've been the mp since since 1983 in 1982 you were the local chairman there in islington north at islington north i think of the constituency labor party and i was chair of hornsey hornsey indeed hornsey and Woodgreen hornsey and Woodgreen. Party. correct the neighboring, neighboring party. That, thank yeah. you for that that correction and in that constituency you supported giving a Labour Party card to an activist, a political activist. It was Tariq Ali. The Labour Party at that time disapproved of that. And you stood by that. And so did your local local party. They said they would stand by that, even if it meant disbanding the local party. And I mentioned that piece of, piece of history because I wonder, is it your hope that your constituency now, Islington North, stands by you at the next general election, even if it means a fallout with the leadership? Well, let's not go into hypothetical questions. The issue is... But it's your hope now that I'm asking the about. The issue is that my Labour Party membership was um, briefly suspended. Hmm. You lost the whip, so you can't stand as a Labour MP. Reinstated as a party member unanimously by hmm. a panel of the NEC, the National Executive Committee of the party. Subsequently, I 
lost the Labour Party, we're therefore not a member of the Parliamentary Labour Party. I think it's a wrong, totally unjustified decision. And um, the local party members and the constituents I speak to, and I speak to a very large number of them, feel it's extremely wrong and unfair. And they hope that uh, maybe is a good opportunity after the local elections that the whip should be restored. Yeah, I, I understand they hope that. Do you hope they will stand by you as the candidate? Well, let's cross one bridge at a time. Well, I mean, I wonder, I asked the question because I wonder, would you be prepared to, to run as an independent at the next one election? one bridge at a time. And if I ask you, could you win? You're going to say that's hypothetical too, aren't you? Because you Listen, I'm proud to be the MP for Islington North. I enjoy representing the people of Islington North and um, I spend all all my time doing what MPs should do, and that is if you could taking up issues but also representing my constituents. Yeah. I wonder if you could stomach the idea of being an independent Labour MP and becoming an enemy to a new Labour government, because that's what you'd be. I think you're getting a bit ahead of yourself, if I may say mm. so. I think you're getting a long way ahead of yourself, John. Well, the issue is... It's not entirely that, academic. I ask because, Jeremy, I wonder, well, have, it, did you all... keep count? Did you keep count yourself? of the number of times you voted against your Labour government under Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. It's a real question. Did you keep count? No. Well, it was something like 428 times. Yeah, some, some of those were... Well, also, there were many thousands of votes during that period. And so, uh, as a proportion of the total votes, I have no idea what it is. But it did make you the most rebellious uh, well, MP there's I ever been, I think. prepared to um, stand up against... Yes, the war in Iraq, which I did, and I make no apology for that. And indeed, I made an apology for the party's involvement in that when I was leader of the party. But I also stood up against 90-day detention, and mm. I stood up um, to oppose student fees mm. and um, other issues as well, such as um, uh, local government expenditure and, and other issues. So you, you have to stand up at times and say what you believe. There were certainly plenty of issues in, in that time. Well, you can answer this question. Do you rule out, will you now, here today, will you rule out starting a new political party, maybe building on your, your peace and justice project? This is hypothetical morning, isn't it, no, John? I'm asking you, will you today rule that out? Listen, um, I don't know what the future is going to bring. I'm focused on representing my constituency, being a member of parliament, and on... Um, saying to the Labour Party to win the next election you have to appeal to people and you have to appeal to people on the basis of economic justice and changes in the power structures within our society. Abandoning policies that would achieve that, particularly public mm. ownership, is not going to excite people. Yeah. But you, you, will, you will know because you've been around, uh, you will know that you had an opportunity there to rule out running as an independent candidate against Labour, an opportunity to rule out starting you know, your own political party. an opportunity party, to and rule out answering hypothetical questions and that I have ruled out. Well, but you're not going to rule I've that out. I've ruled out hypothetical questions. All right, let, let me ask you this about, about uh, you're not going to me, give me more than that. I'm going to draw my own conclusions. A lot of people will, which is you're keeping the idea open. You can, rule, uh, you can accept I've ruled out hypothetical questions. You can draw whatever conclusions you wish from that. That is your right and freedom as a very respected journalist. Well, that's, you're too kind. Look, you gave the European Union back at the time of the, the referendum. You gave it seven and a half out of ten. That's because a lot of people suspected you were, you know, at heart, a real Eurosceptic. I wonder what mark out of ten you would give Keir Starmer's leadership now, Jeremy? Um, I gave the European Union seven and a half out of ten. I thought it was seven, actually, but you say seven and a half. You said seven to seven and a half. Oh, but, did I? Okay. But uh, what would you give Keir Starmer? I'm not going to judge you're not going to judge? No, I mean, he's. it's not easy leading the Labour Party. It's not easy leading the opposition. I do not agree with the number of the policy pronouncements he's made. He knows that. Um, I know that. You know that because I support uh, public ownership of um, utilities, um, mail, rail, water. And uh, I support a, an economic strategy which is redistributive of wealth and power within our society. We have... The greatest crisis of poverty within our society for a very long time. We have more food banks than branches of DWP or McDonald's. We have thousands of people queuing up every week at a food bank just to try and survive. That's not right. 
Mm. And if we're going to deal with that, it's not good enough just to say it's um, appalling. We have to actually start to seriously redistribute power and wealth in our society. And I fear that the economic direction in which the party is going at the moment will not address those fundamental issues. Right. You, you say they're going in <coughs> entirely the wrong direction. <coughs> Kirstarmer kicked you out of the parliamentary party because you didn't apologise for saying that the accusation of anti-Semitism on your watch... You didn't apologise for saying that was exaggerated and politically motivated. Now, time has passed. Will you take an opportunity now, do you choose to, to offer some kind of apology or qualification? Look, anti-Semitism is vile, evil and wrong under any circumstances. You said it was exaggerated wait, and wait politically a minute, wait motivated. A minute, let me finish. I said it's vile, evil and wrong under any circumstances. And I introduced processes within the... Um, within the Labour Party, which would ensure that there was a hearing for people that were accused of that and, if necessary, sanctions could be taken. The numbers of people that were sanctioned or were arguments from um, accusations made against them was actually quite small. Mm. And the reason I gave the statement I did at the result of the HRC was to say, one, I accepted the inquiry, two... I would work with the party to implement the necessary changes that they recommended. But three, I would defend mm. Labour Party members who opinion polls showed at that time the public opinion was that a sort of third of Labour Party members were somehow or other anti-Semitic. The reality was it was less than mm. 1%. You're, 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 and so I made, I, made, number of I, I made that very clear. Yes. And I made that very clear then and still do. Any kind of racism is unacceptable. Anti-Semitism, yeah. Islamophobia, far-right racism is equally wrong but in any Jews circumstances. Who felt hurt, who felt offended by anti-Semitism on your watch, don't they deserve some kind of apology? Was not their offence genuine? Of course uh, people should not be subject to anti-Semitism. Of course it is wrong, and I made that very, very clear in a very lengthy statement I made uh, in you're August... Not going to answer August that. You're not going to answer that August now. August 2018, I made that very, very clear. I would also point out that um, people that are currently being suspended from the Labour Party include a wholly disproportionate number of uh, members of Jewish Voice for Labour and Jewish socialist organisations, which I find depressing to put it mildly surely we need to just agree anti-semitism islamophobia racism in any form is unacceptable in our political life and obviously within our party no, let me ask you this because some news uh, just in sorry, and you that. you were there earlier earlier today at westminster magistrates court an order has been given to extradite the founder of wikileaks julian assange i think that is a terrible decision shameful and uh, the issue will now go to Priti Patel as Home Secretary to make a decision on extradition. Julian Assange is a brave journalist who told the world the truth about much of what went on in the war on terror, Afghanistan, Iraq, and so on, and um, has ended up in a maximum security prison in Britain where there is no conviction against him. He's just in this maximum security prison in an appalling state. His health has been seriously damaged by it. If he's extradited to the USA, he will likely get a sentence, a multiple life sentence of 175 years in a maximum security prison in the United States. He will spend the rest of his life in prison. For what? For telling the world the truth about what happened in Guantanamo Bay, telling the world the truth about what the CIA's plans were in country after country. Every journalist, yourself included, should stand with Julian Assange because if Julian Assange gets extradited and imprisoned in the USA, it's obviously devastating for him and his family and his supporters, but it's also such a terrible message about freedom of the press and what journalists should do, and it would then become a deterrent for any other journalist. And as I said this morning outside the court, had Julian Assange been a, um, a whistleblower, etc., in China or Russia, the Western media would be lauding him as a hero. And because he's told uncomfortable truths about... Um, United States foreign policy, he is now 
possibly facing a multiple life sentence in prison. I think that's a very, very sad decision. Okay, I do want to take, get your view on that on the, on the record. Now, just lastly, because I think we're running out of, out of time, just, just a, a verdict on your, on your time, if, if you like. I mean, after, in 2019, the worst result for Labour in many ways since 1935, do you feel, Jeremy, your leadership was good for Labour? And if so, how? I became leader of the Labour Party because I wanted to change the direction of the party on economic issues and uh, international issues, environmental issues and so on. And um, we developed a very different policy and narrative and that came out in both the 2017 and 2019 election manifestos, which... Um, individually each of the policies actually was very popular we lost defeats since 1935 can i can i it's not actually i'll explain why in terms of seats I'll, yes i'm glad you've qualified that because the number of votes that were cast for labor candidates in 2019 was more than in previous general elections, including the 2005 election, and not far different to the Labour vote in the 2001 election. The problem is the seats allocation, and obviously we lost the election on that, and we lost the election on the simplicity of um, Boris Johnson saying he'd get Brexit done um, without ever ex exactly explaining how. And um, we are now paying the price Were of you that. Good for we, Labour? Were you good for Labour? Well, I suffered more character assassination from more newspapers and more journalists than any other leader has ever suffered at any time. And I am very grateful for the people in the Labour Party and the public who stood by and said this is simply wrong what is being done to the leadership, not just me, but other colleagues who were in leading positions in the party at that time. And unless we deal with the way in which um, right-wing media agendas deal with um, politicians in this country, then it's a sad day for our democracy. Obviously, I did everything I could to win both the general elections. And I have to say that um, when I stepped down as leader of the party, there were 600,000 members and a very healthy bank balance. Mm. There isn't that now. Right, look, look, your place in history is going to depend on who's writing the book. We, we, we know that. How do you want to be remembered in a sentence? I'm not going away, so it's not a question of remembering. I'm how nice your epitaph here. I just wonder how do you want well, to be well, remembered. It sounds like you are, actually. Well, I'm sure you don't intend to do that. Listen, I am politically active because I'm unhappy with the way our society is. I'm unhappy with the inequality, the injustice, the environmental destruction and all the other issues and therefore we have to challenge the power structures and the class structure of our society and that is what i've spent my life doing and that's what i'll spend the rest of my life doing jeremy corbyn thank you it's been a pleasure thank you